Hello, I'm Professor Liu. I'm here today with a special guest artist, Layla Fay, who is currently an MFA graduate student at the Yale University School of Art. Welcome to our video where we give tips to visual artists. If you can't afford an art class or if you're trapped indoors like everybody on the planet right now, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof to keep you occupied, critiques and tutorials. Layla, you and I actually go really way back. I believe we met each other in 2013. That was seven years ago. That's Do you crazy. want to tell our audience how we know each other? Yeah, um, Clara, you were my first professor at RISD in um, the drawing fundamentals course. And that I was already, I knew I was in love with drawing and it just kind of set it in stone that I was obsessed. <laughs> um, and I remember a few projects that we had that got me really into it. Um, and I still have the vertebra. It was like a giant, um, it was one of the biggest drawings I had done. And I remember just being like, so sure that I, I love drawing and painting because of that. You know, it's crazy. I remember that drawing <laughs> <laughs> all these years. I still remember that vertebrae drawing. All it right. was so much fun. Yeah. Wow. So many of you guys in the chat. Welcome. I think it's so great to have all of you guys here with all the chaos. I feel like these 10 p.m. streams are something we can all come to rely on. Well, so the other thing is that Layla was my student for that one semester. But actually, these images you guys are looking at here, this is a little piece of art prof history because <laughs> Layla was in the very first our prop video that we ever shot. This is a still from 2015. This was before we had launched the website. This was before I knew anything that was going on. Layla, what's it like to look at these old photos from that shoot and to look at where art prof is today? I mean, it's, I mean, we started when you were just taking off and figuring out if this was all gonna work. And it felt super experimental, but you, I remember you just being so ready to do it. Um, and it made so much sense. And it just over the years has made more and more sense, especially right now. Um, it, it was exciting. I was super nervous for that <laughs> video, I remember. <laughs> um, so those stills are really funny to see, but it was fun. Total blast from the past. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Layla is currently a MFA student, Masters of Fine Arts uh, degree student at Yale University. So here we have a couple images of Layla in her studio. But as many, many students are going through right now, that all came to a grinding halt. And mm -hmm. Layla Yale is now transitioning to remote classrooms. And mm -hmm. you had to get out of your studio pretty fast. What was that whole transition like, finding out what was going on and having to make all these changes? Yeah, that was um, pretty intense. I found out actually that we had to move out of our studios while I was um, out of the city. So I came back and I just had a few days to pack up my studio, um, which I have to say it is one of the most amazing studios I've ever had. So it was really hard to leave it, but um, it did force me to kind of decide what were really essential materials for me to take. Um, and I really just, I took the essentials and, and left and kind of said, see you later, hopefully not too, too far into the future. Um, but it was a pretty, um, I had to really make some decisions on what I really needed um, and that were important to my practice, yeah. So what were the essentials? What were some of the items that you were like, definitely got to take this stuff? Yeah, so I went back to the basics and um, took a lot of drawing materials, which, um, you know, just like um, pencils, paper, charcoal, um, always charcoal, I love charcoal, and um, pastels. Um, and then I have been getting into monotype um, printing. And that was the one thing I was really worried about not being able to do. But I did take some plates, um, so just some plexi plates with me and um, some ink. 
And I just was like, okay, I'm gonna figure out how to do this on my own and figuring that out. Um, but those are kind of the basics. I have acrylic paint as well. Um, so it's not non-toxic um, in the apartment that I'm in. Let's see, we've got a question from Chung Men. Can I ask some questions? How is the process of applying to Yale? We are actually gonna do another stream that is dedicated solely to that. But Layla, maybe you can just give it to us in a nutshell briefly. Um, it's a pretty, I was really nervous applying. I also decided to be honest, kind of late that I was going to apply to grad school. Um, it's really based around your statement of purpose, um, for why you want to go to grad school, why Yale, um, is the place for you, um, and explaining your art practice and then, um, a really succinct, um, portfolio of work that is recent work. Um, and then there's an interview process if you get past that written process that is in person. Was the yeah. interview stressful? It was so stressful. <laughs> I was so nervous. I mean, what were they asking you about? Were they asking you what your artwork was about or? Yeah, and you, it's, it's kind of comforting and nerve wracking because you get to set up your art in a, in a kind of gallery setting and you walk in and there's like a table and there's two of the faculty there and they kind of just, they kind of drill you, but it's at the same time conversational and it, the, it ebbs and flows energy wise and it depends who you have. But once I was in there, it wasn't scary. Um, once I just, you know, realized it was a conversation with two other artists, I was like, okay, my art's around me. And like, I know what I'm doing. I have to remind myself, I know what I'm doing. And then it wasn't so scary. It's just like the anticipation. Um, that's the scary part. Let's see, Christina saying, what's your current artist statement? All right, well, we're looking at pictures of Layla's recent work that she's done at her MFA program. Layla, can you just tell us a little bit about what your art is about and what are some of the themes you're working with? Yeah, it's really funny because I'm <laughs> I'm working on a new artist statement right now. I've ki I'm kind of like starting from scratch. Um, and I do feel like coming to grad school, one of my biggest anxieties was feeling like I didn't have a good um, kind of like what I'm doing as an artist. And I've found that grad school is the perfect place to, <laughs> to figure that out, but also be more confused. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, but my work is, um, it's figurative, um, it's anecdotal, it has a lot to do with memory and um, familial relationships and identity um, sort of building um, and how we kind of move around the world based on our experiences as a child. So it's kind of a mix of present and past, um, political and social, uh, more social than political, but I think that those, those tied together too. So, and Layla, we're yeah. looking at this really huge one that you sent me. It's of this little girl who's crying and there's this adult that's trying to embrace her. It's the images mm -hmm. of you in the studio. Can you give us some specifics about that particular narrative and what you're exploring in that painting? Yeah, so it's um, based on a real sort of event that happened. Um, the figure that's trying to hold me is, my, is representing my mom. Um, and I come from a biracial background. And it was, uh, it's a mix of a real thing that happened. I was accused of stealing as a child and my mom was trying to protect me and it was a sort of like social racial discourse that happened in front of me as a kid that i was like whoa what's happening one of the, the first moments i realized that people are looking at me differently than my mom um and i wanted to kind of go back and and capture that and this kind of like um surreal um breakdown of that moment um it was, it, I think it was more of a cathartic piece than anything. Um, but that's, those are the themes I was um, working through in that painting. And Layla, are these paintings that we're looking at right now, are these all in oil? These are acrylic Oh, paintings. they're all in acrylic. So yeah. were you using oil in your school studio? I wasn't actually. I, I haven't used oil since, this is so weird. I haven't used oil paint since freshman year. Really? Which is super weird. I know. I had an oil, I actually did have an oil painting class this last semester, but he allowed us to use acrylic 
and I opted for acrylic. Um, I think there's like this funny, uh, oil paint is amazing, um, but there's this funny sort of um, like conversation of, around what materials are good materials or like respected. And I, I kind of have fun using a material that maybe isn't seen as like a high art material and using it like it is. Um, and also I, I just enjoy the process of how quickly um, acrylic paint dries and that layering process is really fun for me. Yeah, I mean, I love oil paintings, don't get me wrong, but oil painting's a pain in the butt. Oh man, you gotta wait so long for stuff to dry. You gotta get all the meat, it's so expensive. It's like, you have to really, in my opinion, have a very compelling reason why it has to be oil paint when you have so many other options out there, right? Mm -hmm. I agree. And it's a lot, it's, it's more cost effective too. And there's a lot of mediums that you can mix into acrylic that make it just as interesting as working with um, oil paint. Let's see, yeah. we have some comments in the chat. Dylan is saying the expression is definitely really powerful. Sling Bomb is saying it looks very Byzantine. And Dylan's also saying, don't only half a dozen people get accepted every year. It's pretty exclusive, so I hear. Very impressive. It is. I mean, it's pretty much known as the number one MFA program in the U.S. I mean, I applied. I did not get in. So it's it's very common for people to apply and not get in. So when you actually get in, it, it really says something about, um, you know, you as an artist, because it, it takes a lot to get into that program. Um, I'm not surprised because I know Layla. But <laughs> uh, <thanks. laughs> By the way, if you guys want to see more of Layla's work, she is on Instagram. So she is at Layla.Fay. And all of this information is in the video description below if you guys would like to read more about that. So Layla, let's talk about moving out of the studio. Mm -hmm. Did you not have a lot of time to do that? Was it pretty abrupt? Yeah. They, because everything occurred so quickly, the, the school was actually, they're pretty vague in the beginning of what, what, if we were going to be kicked out of the studio. So we had a period of time where we thought that we would be able to work in the studio just really carefully um, and kind of keeping to the social dist distancing practices because we have like separate closed door studios. Um, but over like, it was like a week we thought we could be there. And then in like a day, they're like, actually, uh, you have to leave in a few days. And I got back like a day before, a few days before that happened. So um, I kind of mentally prepared before I went in there and was like, okay, I'm going to take these specific things. Um, but it was, it was really fast. I mean, I think it must be really hard for you because you only did one semester and then this happened because you're a first year, right? Totally. And yeah, so what was yeah. that? Just having done one semester, you're back from spring break, you're ready to go. And all of a sudden this happens. I mean, I imagine for a lot of people, it's very emotional to have this just come to a grinding halt. It was emotional. And it, it also took me a long time to warm up to the studio space and just the building itself. Um, it was real. it, felt intimidating to me to work in that space. And I was just becoming, it just started to become more of a home to me, that's the studio, especially because it's so private and we hold um, studio visits in there and it kind of feels like you're welcoming somebody into your space. Um, so it was, it, w it felt like a weird time for it to happen. It, it's of course a weird time for everybody, but I was especially, I was just beginning to feel like okay, this is my space. And then it was like, no, you have to leave. <laughs> so it was, it was hard. Um, it was hard, but I, I'm, I feel lucky that I have a room in the apartment I'm in that I can use. Well, we've got yeah. photos of Layla's home studio. And I imagine that a lot of you guys probably had to do some shifting. I mean, I'm working <laughs> in this strange multi-purpose room at my house that has yeah. no closed doors or <laughs> it's like the least <laughs> private room in my whole house, but I'm like, okay, I guess this is where I am now. <laughs> That's yeah. just what it's going to be. Um, so tell me in the chat, have you had to reorganize your house or bring your studio home? Because I imagine a lot of people have had to do that recently. 
And so Layla, what did you decide to do for setting up your home space? Did, did you have something in mind or was it just, let's just grab whatever's here? Any thoughts yeah. going into arranging your space at home? Um, I am kind of a really, I love organizing and I'm the same. <laughs> Actually, I'm you like, know what? I love organizing, but when my desk is clean, it means uh, that I'm procrastinating. Yeah. For me, it's it's so weird. For me, it's the opposite. And you know, what's hilarious is like, I don't know that many other painters who are like this. And people came into my studio last semester and be like, oh no, this is not going to stay neat. And then they came in at the end. They're like, okay, this is weird because this usually doesn't happen. Because <laughs> painters are, I don't know why, stereotypically known as being like, kind of messy and like you know all over the place and just like in it um but I'm kind of the opposite I really like to have like things laid out I know that's not for everybody but it did make the moving out process a lot easier because I knew where everything was and I was like okay this has that in it I'll just take that um (laughs) um, and when I came to set up here I already kind of knew that I just needed a a desk to sit at to read and and write because that's part of my practice right now. And um, how is writing part of your practice? Um, I kind of use it as an entry point into painting. Sometimes it will just be free um, sort of writing, or I'll write uh, about a memory, or it'll be a poem that kind of prompts a painting, um, and that's helped me when I feel uh, kind of stuck and and out of ideas. Just something as simple as just even writing a, a diary entry could help me um, just kind of get out of a, a funk. Yeah, remember, uh, you, you have the most dense sketchbook writing I've ever seen because oh, you have this extraordinary that. handwriting in it. I always felt like whenever you showed me your sketchbook, I was looking at some ancient manuscript from Egypt That's or something. <laughs> funny that is so funny that you say that I when I um I had another professor who I studied in in Rome with um at at RISD and he said the same thing and it was even funnier because we were looking through manuscripts and he was like he would like look at the manuscript he's like these look so similar it's so funny but yeah I still I still write a lot yeah let's see Mm -hmm. we've got some questions Andreas is saying how important is it to get an MFA will it improve the skills knowledge and mindset of an artist Or is it some kind of administrational license to be accepted in the higher academic industry? I'm going to let you answer that, Layla. Ooh, that's, oh, so so I know, I knew that I wanted to teach from a pretty, I, I I was lucky enough to go to an arts high school. um, And that really set the tone for my interest in wanting to teach painting one day. Uh, so I've always carried that that wand at a college level. Um, so that was a big reason why I went back to um, to grad school because I knew I wanted to teach at a college level. Um, and I graduated from undergrad, and I just I felt like I was just beginning to understand <laughs> my practice. And then all of a sudden, I like was. I felt just out in the world kind of spinning around without any sort of um, feedback or like artist um, conversation to to keep me going. So that that's another reason why I went back. But I do think um, you don't need grad school. I don't think that you need grad school to feel like you're an artist or successful or anything. But I, I knew that I wanted another level of education that would let me teach one day if that was something I wanted to do. I mean, teaching really is the one thing that an MFA will qualify you to do at the college level. It does get complicated because in the US, if you want to teach high school, that's a completely different degree. If you want to teach college, you have to get an MFA. And Mm -hmm. long time ago, nobody really cared. Like in the 70s, (laughs) I think it was just like, oh, I'll just hire my friends. And now it's become this whole (laughs) circus of totally. search committees and campus visits it's extremely yeah. complicated now and so having that cool. mfa degree you really have to have it now you can't get by on a personal connection because it has become so formalized but as layla says 
you can never go to an MFA degree and do fine as an artist. It's just you're not qualified to teach at the college level. That, that's the one yeah. thing. But of course, there are many other reasons to go to an MFA program. And we probably will um, get Layla back to explain about that more in another stream. Let's Very see. Cool. We've got some other stuff in the chat. Ashley's saying, I'm an online student. I've been fortunate enough to have to change my routine very little. That's good. Christina's using their kitchen counter. Awesome. Tammy nice. is setting up their studio as we chat. Love it clean and organized too. A nice place to put my <laughs> coffee. Love the charcoal pieces. George cannot believe that you're a painter and you're not messy. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Miriam is saying, how much space did you have between graduating your undergraduate program and starting your MFA? I had a little bit under two years. Um, and to, for me, that was just the right amount of time to realize I wanted to go back to school. <laughs> I had been, I moved, I moved um, away from my hometown and where I went to RISD. Um, and I was actually, I was living in San Francisco and I had like a basement studio. I was actually living in the basement and turned it into a studio. So I've had practice doing the home. So you're not before. very good at the skill, huh? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I had a, a little over a year and a half to realize I was like, okay, I'm ready to try again. And by the way, for those of you who are maybe thinking about doing an MFA at some point, I do tell all my students, don't go straight into grad school from undergrad. Mm -hmm. I really think minimum a year in between just to clear your head. I mean, really? I don't know about you, Layla, but when I finished my undergraduate degree, I felt like my head was exploding. Like there was Definitely. too much in my head and I needed to just breathe and just yeah. not be told anything new <laughs> for a little while so I could actually process what it was I had learned. I mean, totally. how did you feel when you got out of art school after your undergraduate I, uh, program? Yeah, I actually was so sure that I didn't want to go back to school. <laughs> like I had an amazing time at RISD. Actually, I can say that honestly, um, I had an incredible time, but I left and I was like, I think that's all I need. Like maybe I'll, like, like I've said before, I was interested in t pursuing um, a career in teaching. So I was like, maybe I should, should go back, but I was like, I'll wait a while. Cause I was like, I was really tired. And I was like, I'm excited to figure out how to do this outside of um, the educational art system. And yeah, I needed some space. I needed some headspace and some time to figure out what, who I was as an artist outside of academic art, the academic art world. Um, I really recommend taking time. I, I was actually thinking that I would be applying more than just this once. It was for me, this was starting to apply because as you say, it it's, can be really hard to get into grad school um, program. So I was actually thinking of this as like the beginning of applying. Um, and it was, a, it was a good amount of time. I f feel like anything less, I wouldn't have been ready to be a student again. Yeah, you really have to be in the right place, I think, to go back to your program because I feel like a lot of people do it because they don't know what to do next. And I'm like, no, yeah. you should go out and just being an artist without the structure of a school and just feel it out. If anything, to just realize, oh my God, the world yeah. is such a big place. Yeah. And I am a little yeah. speck of dust. <laughs> At least that was my revelation. Was I just felt like less than a speck of dust after mm -hmm. art school. Yeah. I was a speck of dust in a random basement and I was like, I need something to grasp onto. <laughs> exactly. Let's see, yeah. we got a question from Slingbon. At what point did you start ta taking stylized decisions when painting? That's a great question because Layla, when I think about your charcoal drawings that you did in my freshman drawing class, it's too bad I don't have some of them here. Um, they were beautifully drawn. I mean, you, oh my God, you did this one drawing of your hair. Do you remember this drawing? I remember it. It was like yeah. this abstraction of your dreadlocks that you had. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking, wow, those dreadlocks, they look really mystical. Like they had this yes. incredible atmosphere to them. But your work doesn't look like that now. Your work is very, very different. I mean, 
what I think, I'm sorry to give you a critique without announcing it, but <laughs> I feel like yeah, what no, I really okay. respond to about your work is they're really emotional pieces, but they're also pieces that make you a little bit uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's why to me, they are so impactful because things aren't quite right in a lot of these. Like even this first piece yeah. that we were looking at earlier, this one with the um, the two babies that are like drinking the breast milk and everything. Mm -hmm. It's like on mm -hmm. one hand, those are such elegant, beautiful shapes, but the babies are, are monstrous looking yeah. in a way. And I yeah. noticed that that's something you really started to ramp up in your work. So when did you start doing that more severe stylization? Yeah, I was, so in high school, I was really, um, and before, I was really obsessed with just trying to make things as real as possible. Like I was the kind of artist who would just have a sketchbook full of eyes and I would just like try and make this eye look as real as possible. <laughs> None of us ever and, did that before, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel it was strange because I came from that, from um, high school into um, undergrad and I, started kind of testing out like more um, aesthetic styles. I still wasn't really into conceptual ideas yet. So um, I got really interested in like patterns and graphic kind of qualities. Um, and that kind of mixed with my interest in real, in realism. And that has over the years kind of created this sort of dystopian, I don't know, um, surreal um, interest that I'm still figuring it out, figuring out, but I do really like this sort of um, aesthetic, this first aesthetic kind of pull and draw in that you kind of get from graphic design and how things are maybe balanced or um, imbalanced in a work um, alongside a more kind of um, gripping, like realistic kind of gro like grotesque, um, beautiful rendering. I don't know if that, it's something I'm still figuring out, but it, I'm really, um, obsessed with that. Well, and this has also seemed like it's translated into printmaking. Like you, I think we were talking like a few months ago and you were talking about printmaking and I went, Ooh, like the printmaking nerd of me, <laughs> like got yeah. really excited. And you said you were frustrated because you were just starting to really get into the print shop at school. And now yeah. this happened and guess what guys, our prof came to the rescue because what did I ship you Layla? That should be arriving oh any day now. I can't wait. A jelly plate. I'm so excited to use it, especially because I tried monotyping um, at home with a normal, just flex, like not too flexible, um, plexiglass plate. Oh, it doesn't and work. It, just, it was not, I even have like a big roller, like, um, that I, I took from the print shop and it just didn't get the same quality. It, it looks kind of dry, even though I wet the paper and everything. And it just didn't have the lusciousness of a, Monotype. Which is exactly so, why we do it, monotype, right? It's for those Yeah, it's exactly why. <laughs> um, and what I'm missing. So I'm super excited to use the jelly plate. And I watched the tutorial. I watched the tutorial when it came out, and then I rewatched it. And I was like, how did I forget? This is for exactly what I needed. But I, I didn't think about it because I had access to a print shop. And now that I don't, it's the perfect thing. So I'm really excited to, to try it. Yeah, so if you guys have not watched this tutorial, a jelly plate... I mean, it's basically exactly what it sounds like. It's like a big hunk of jello. And you basically <laughs> just throw paint on it. You can use a brush. You can wipe away with a rag. You can do a lot of different things with it. And typically, I see people using it a lot for like greeting cards and creating lots of textured patterns and stuff like that. But you really can get results that are pretty close to a monotype that you would do on a press with plexiglass. And... <laughs> I have to say maybe the silver lining of not having these school studios is that you guys get to pick up some tools or some materials that you would not have ordinarily used and learn how to get a result that's actually pretty good. Like this is one I did of a celery root 
And yes, Layla, I did cheat and go back in and paint on it a little bit. That's okay, right? I love doing that, though. You will do that, too. You just, (laughs) you know, be a little more discreet about it. (laughs) So anyway, Miriam is saying, when it comes to financially supporting yourself before applying to an MFA, would you recommend supporting yourself in an artistic field to help your application? What do you think, Layla? Mm. I, okay, so I did a residency in San Francisco in between the time that I was graduated from, that I graduated from undergrad and applied, but it was a super unconventional residency. It wasn't actually with an art, like, program or um, company or anything. It was with, um, like, a law firm, like a mitigation firm, and I was their first artist Um, in residence so I kind of had this interesting perspective of being an artist in a space that wasn't used to artists and I think that that actually interested um, the people who are reviewing the professors um, and faculty who are reviewing my um, statement of purpose because I did mention it and I do think it can help but it doesn't have to be uh, like a conventional sort of artist practice. I was also sign making. I did some like interior painting jobs too. Um, and that I, I mentioned as well. So it doesn't have to be a traditional sort of thing, but I think as long as you kind of keep working at your practice, whatever that means for you, um, is helpful. I mean, my impression, Layla, from MFA applications is that really it's the portfolio in the statement because mm-hmm. yeah, it's good to get some experience. Like if, if you work at a museum in a collections area or something like that, that's fine. But I don't think that's really what gets you into the program. Oh. I think the program really is about the portfolio and statement. Yeah, I just remembered that I, I was really worried because I didn't have, um, I hadn't had any gallery shows or anything. And all my friends who were applying had a bunch of gallery shows and their CV looked amazing. I was like, oh no, I'm not gonna get in. And when I had the interview, they were actually like, no, we don't mind. It's actually nicer when you're kind of not worried about that sort of thing yet. So it was it was interesting to me that that wasn't as important as I thought. Right. And the thing is, people who apply for an MFA program, they're coming from all walks of life. I mean, when I did my MFA program, one of my friends was like 40 years old. I was like 26 at the time. So you get people from so many different parts of their lives. And I I think it's really a wonderful thing. I mean, my whole thing now is I felt when I was younger, I was a little bit too much tunnel vision in terms of like stuff to do that. Oh, it had to be art related. But Mm -hmm. I find inspiration from all kinds of things that are nothing to do with art. Like I was saying the other day that I like to read books by doctors. Don't ask me why. I like reading about the healthcare (laughs) industry. It's just really (laughs) fascinating to me. So I I think it's great to do things that are not so related. Yeah. Definitely. I agree with that for sure. Let's see. Nathan's saying people practice things that are easiest for them, which is a bad habit in music and art. I think when people are very used to drawing eyes, they're more likely to draw more eyes. That, that sort of <laughs> like, don't you feel like that's what algorithms are like now? It's like if you yeah. search for eyes, Amazon mm-hmm. tells you buy these eyes and it, it's sort of yeah, a bummer. Totally. Like we should have an yeah. anti-algorithm to ex- expose us to different things. Yeah, I wish. I had the same. It was like that for me, too, with, with drawing. It was like noses, eyes, mouths. <laughs> and I stuck with it for a long time. Well, And I'm still doing it. <laughs> and so, Layla, really briefly, what's it been like being in a remote classroom now? I know that you've been doing some meetings with professors and Zoom and stuff like that. How's that transition been for you? It's super strange. It's really, it's, it's an awkward transition, to be honest. Um, but I, I am lucky to say that um, my practice makes sense for a home, a small home studio um, with like very minimal sort of materials because I was trying to kind of strip back my practice a little bit. So I'm, I'm glad to say that works. Um, I am worried about how we're going to do critiques in this like transitioning from how we did them in school to an online setting is is going to be challenging um have you guys because, had a group critique yet on zoom or no we're we're and, and we're reformatting how we're going to do that so it's still taking shape um and i have like 
I didn't have my big crit, which everyone has um, once a year. I didn't have it yet. It was actually supposed to be in April. So I'm one of the eight students. The eight, there's eight first years who are having it virtually. So we're re-examining how we're going to do that in a way that feels um, good. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting. But the one-on-one the -on -one meetings with my professors and, and artists, which we have a lot of, um, that would have been studio visits physically in the, in the space, those actually feel pretty pretty good still. Mm. And they're actually kind of comforting. But the, the larger classes feel strange. Um, well, because I feel like a lot of the teachers, understandably so, are very stressed out about the group mm -hmm. thing. Like, okay, well, I have yeah. 16 students in this class. How do I actually manage doing this? But what I've been actually saying to a lot of students and other teachers is, look, here's a chance for you to really connect with your students one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, mm -hmm. it depends on your situation. I know some teachers have huge classes and maybe they just can't make it happen because of the numbers. But if you are in a situation to do that, sometimes if I'm in a student's um, class and we're just hanging out and I just say something really quick to them, but it's like online, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna actually yeah. put aside like, okay, here's 20 minutes for Sarah that I really mm -hmm. wanna concentrate on Sarah. Like that's something you would normally not get so much in a brick and mortar classroom. So yeah. I wonder if maybe that's somewhat the silver lining to this very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. who knows? Let's see, Definitely. Enoch is saying in the chat, study for a degree, nah, let me watch this entire gastrointestinal surgery. <laughs> I love you guys, this is great. And Dylan is saying, I'm tired of seeing the same kinds of YouTube videos being recommended, except of course, when it's our prof, of course. And Nathan says, quote, buy those eyes, are you sure you're on Amazon and not the black market? <laughs> Yeah, you guys caught that me. I, uh, you know, all those <laughs> eyeballs, <laughs> they come in really yeah. handy. So <laughs> anyway, um, I hope you guys will take some time and explore artprof.org. We've got lots of cool resources on there for you guys to check out. And I hope you will subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. Thank you to all of you with your very funny, hilarious comments in the chat. A lot of thoughtful comments. You guys really make these streams so much fun. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. We will see you next time. Bye.